So we're doing, uh, I just heard that recording in progress. And now we're also going to go live on live streaming. So folks, we are about to be global in what we're doing over here. That's awesome. All right. Well, here we are, folks. Hey, it is 12 noon. It's high noon. And welcome to Lunch with Randy and Teddy. And we've got a great show today. Now, Teddy's not here, so make sure you give him the business when you see him next time and let him know that uh, we don't tolerate a whole lot of uh, time off and slack. So Teddy better be better be on his toes when he comes back. But uh, yeah, we've got a great show today, actually. And it was one of those things that, you know, you, you think about when you're younger, and that is, what do I want to do with my life? And, and how do I go about figuring that out, whether it's going to college, whether it's trade school, whether it's you whatever opening my own business doing whatever and and sometimes apprenticeships sometimes internships those kinds of things can help us formulate or at least eliminate maybe things that that we don't want to do or things that we might like to do and so that's we're going to cover that today uh but first let me introduce uh leslie spees our co-host tell us a little bit about you and then i'll throw it back to me and and we'll get started okay well yeah. hello everybody i am glad to be back I didn't screw up too bad the last time. Um, so as Randy said, my name is Leslie Spees. I work for The Resource, which is a career services and human capital management company. And I lead a consulting division that does HR and organizational development consulting. Uh, so I've known Randy for, for quite some time. And uh, we're on the Winston-Salem Sherm board together. So I'm excited to be here and hopefully won't mess things up too much. <laughs> Famous last words. So that's great, Leslie. Thank you again for joining us. And a long time no see. I saw you this morning in a meeting. So uh, you're still in the same chair, and so am I. So we're we're we're, we're going places. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Randy Wooden. I run Goodwill's Professional Center here in Winston Salem. Been doing it since about uh, ooh, 2012, and the checks keep cashing, so I keep showing up, and that's a good thing. But we help professionals. Uh, we're free. We don't charge anything. Our role is to help people do a better job of the job hunt. And so maybe somebody with a degree or has been in a leadership role, maybe they owned a company or maybe they're employed and they just say, you know what, it's time. And a lot of people are kind of at that point right now with the market the way it is and, and jobs are somewhat plentiful. So why not put my toe in the water? And, and so again, we're here to help, happy to try to help you get to where you want to go. But yeah, we have two special guest today. So in no particular order, let's start with Danielle Rose. And Danielle, you are with Forsyth Tech. So tell us a little bit more about your role there. And, um, and then we'll move to Terry and have her share a little bit about her role. Great. Well, thank you so much yeah. for having me. I think this might be the first time I've been live streamed in front of 18,000 people. So this is very exciting. <laughs> Don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. All right. <laughs> I, uh, I do work at Forsyth Tech. I've been here since um, the start of 2016. So I think that's about five and a half years if I'm doing my math right. And I started in our um, internship office and I now coordinate our apprenticeship program. So I will tease you with that before we get into our questions on what that means at Forsyth Tech. Sure, and let's throw it to Terry Cummings. And Terry, you're with Greater Winston-Salem, Inc. I am. Thank you, yeah. Randy and Leslie, uh, for having us today. We're really excited to be here. I'm glad Danielle can join us. Uh, I'm Terry Cummings with Greater Winston-Salem, Inc. I am the Vice President of Talent and Workforce. So the Talent and Workforce Department, um, you know, has a lot of programs and responsibilities here in the community, uh, especially to serve our students, uh, the school system and community college level and beyond, uh, especially in a career readiness aspect. So today's topic aligns with that perfectly. Um, I come from a background of human resources, so um, kind of infuse that with the, uh, the workforce development and career readiness piece, and uh, I look forward to our discussions today. Cool. Well, if you are watching us and you're one of the however many 20,000 people we have right now, let us know where you're watching us from. We have, uh, we've got Ron. Oh, Ron is, must be on the road. He's in Virginia today. We've got, uh, well, from Boston, we have Bruce and we've got High Point represented Greensboro and 
other places. So don't hesitate. Thomasville. Thanks, Rose. Let us know where you're watching us from. And also let us know if you have questions, if you have comments or questions for our, our panelists. Leslie is going to be on the, the chat box, keeping an eye on that in case we have anything that uh, we'd like to have added to today's conversation. So I, I, let's go ahead and get started. First of all, we want to understand terminology. We, we've, we've used words like internships, apprenticeships, and I may not be the smartest guy, but I always thought those were the same thing. Maybe not literally, but I can understand why they might be confusing. So let's explain first off, and I guess Danielle, we'll start with you with apprenticeships. How does that differ from an internship? And then we'll throw it to Terry for that same perspective. Sounds great. So first, I'm going to start with kind of a broader umbrella term of work-based okay. learning. And so a couple of years ago, the state actually put together a task force and they said, let's define what is work-based learning. And what they found out is exactly what you were saying, Randy. It's not just one thing. It can be anywhere from a simple, you know, one hour job shadow where you watch someone work all the way up to maybe a 8,000 hour registered apprenticeship. And so within that spectrum, I think there were like eight or nine different terms that came out of this um, statewide task force. So for today, I'll define a couple of those here at Forsyth Tech. So for us, work-based learning is actually a very specific term for a course where you go out, a student goes out after they've taken a semester or two of classes and they work at a company related to what they're learning for 160 hours. And in exchange for that 160 hours of work, they get one college credit. So it counts as an elective in their program. So again, the term work-based learning is a very specific term for our four credit internship program. We also started our LEAP program, the Learn and Earn Apprenticeship Program in 2019. And that is a two to three year registered apprenticeship program. And so an, a registered apprenticeship is actually registered through Apprenticeship North Carolina and through the National Department of Labor. And it's the term for a very large um, kind of umbrella program that includes several aspects. And real quickly, I'll go through what those are. So an apprenticeship must include some kind of education. Mm -hmm must include some kind of on-the-job training with a competency checklist and, and a mentor. It must include paid wages for the time you are learning on the job. And it, it ends with some kind of industry credential. And so as you can see, it's much more involved than an apprenticeship. Hmm. I mean, than an internship. <laughs> yeah. and, and also, I, it, a lot of our audience, they're professionals, but many of them are, let's say, mid-career toward end of career, perhaps. So they may have children or even grandchildren who might be coming out of high school or getting ready to get out of college. But something I just wanted to throw out there, and that's it's never too late to start something new. And so correct me if I'm wrong here, but somebody in their 30s, 40s, even 50s yes. is an internship, apprenticeship. Would that be in play for them too? Oh, absolutely. We okay. have had yeah. apprentices ranging in age 17 to, I think, about 57. And so okay. absolutely, that is the purpose of a community college. You know, we are here, we're in your community, we're for people who live in this community, want to stay in this community. And um, yeah, there's really no age limit. We, we pretty much have something for everyone. Wow, that's, I, I hadn't really thought of that. Leslie, you, yeah. Yeah, something. I just had a question. On the LEAP yeah. program, what are some of the fields or trades involved in that? Good question. So right now we kick things off in manufacturing because apprenticeships are a common term in manufacturing. When we talk to the HR professionals and the, the facilities managers, they understand what that means. Um, we have recently registered an automotive apprenticeship and we are in the midst of um, potentially an IT apprenticeship, uh, potentially um, logistics, facilities maintenance, it, really as long as the Department of Labor says it's been approved to be registered as an apprenticeship, we can run with it. Okay. Got you. Thank let's you. Uh, let's flip uh, over to Terry for a moment. Terry with Greater Winston-Salem Inc. And, and your, your area of focus is not necessarily apprenticeships, but is internships. That right? is so how, correct. Yeah. How does that differ from an apprenticeship? What's an internship versus apprenticeship? Internships are 
typically, you know, as Danielle described, there's a lot of structure to the apprenticeship. There's certain criteria to meet certain, um, uh, uh, Sorry, lost my train of thought. There are certain uh, um, certifications at the end. That's certifications at the end yeah. of it that you would get uh, possibly a job offer at the end. And internships are a little bit different in terms of duration. They're they're usually I would say one to three months in duration. Um, you know they can involve multiple tasks um, in an internship or an apprenticeship. You're looking at um, you know learning to do a, a skill or trade. Apprenticeships or internships may actually give you a little bit of a broader base of learning um, entry level uh, in different fields, different areas. And, um, you know, internships can be paid or unpaid as well. So there's a little bit of a difference there. I think the, the biggest difference is the duration and, and really the outcome. You're really getting your feet wet uh, in the workplace. You know, you're learning a little bit more about what you may like, what you may not like, as you mentioned before. Um, and, you know, at Greater Winston-Salem Inc., work-based learning is really rooted in connection and connecting those students to those real life experiences. And um, through, through our programs, especially Aspire Winston-Salem, which is our high school internship program, we administer that. We connect host companies in the Forsyth County area to students, uh, juniors and seniors at Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools who are interested in getting their feet wet, learning more about the workforce and preparing for the workforce. I wanted to always ask, and, and I've been remiss here, I haven't done that, so we're going to do it now. I always am curious about the why and why somebody chooses to pursue the kind of work they do. Uh, and, and you two are no exception. So, Terry, let's stick with you for a minute. Uh, you mentioned you had an HR background, but what is it? Where'd the passion come from here? What was it that said, you know what, I'm in the right path here. This is, this is a good thing for me. You know, it, it came through trial and error. Um, I went into the workforce, a little bit of community college right out of high school, didn't know what I was going to do, didn't know I, what I really wanted to do or what I liked. After a couple of years in the workforce, I figured it out a little bit more. And the HR piece really connected with me because I saw the importance and the complexity and the necessity of the role people play in business and how it all fits together. So I um, went back to school as an adult and, uh, you know, got degree certifications to, to, you know, be in the place I am today. Um, but I think just really that passion came from seeing, um, you know, just again, the necessity that is needed from the people. And that could be, you know, in, in development, um, it could be in, you know, reskilling, upskilling, and just really, you know, what a career means to someone and, you know, how far they can go with it. So it became a little bit more of a, um, a passion as I, I experienced the workforce and, and just, you know, had life experience in general. Yeah. And we hear that a lot. It's, it, we kind of uh, figure it out as, as we go. Uh, Danielle, how about you? What's the why behind why you are doing what you do? It's kind of ironic because when I went to East Carolina University right out of high school, I waited until literally the last moment possible to decide what my major was going to be. And my advisor sat me down and he was basically like, today's the deadline. You got three hours to pick, making all your gen eds. And ironically, I said, I don't ever want other students to have to feel kind of this lost in what they want to do. And so I decided yeah. that I wanted to be a career counselor. I went on to get my master's in counseling and directly out of school, I worked for vocational rehab. So helping job seekers that might have limitations or disabilities um, to, to find jobs. I worked directly with employers. Um, I knew kind of my passion was the employer piece. And so when Forsyth Tech advertised, then the internship uh, position, you know, working with employers to find internships for students, I felt like it was just a natural fit. But I will say, I tell my students all the time, find something that will make you happy for the next five years and life will take you somewhere you might not expect. Because when I graduated high school, I never said, oh, I want to run an apprenticeship program. That sounds fun. Like I didn't even have to spell apprenticeship, you know? So <laughs> it sounds like, sounds like me. Yeah. I was going to play center field for the Red Sox, but, uh, you know, life happens. And so here I sit. Yeah, uh, I th yeah go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, I was just I was agreeing with you. Yeah, absolutely. It's ironic how we get where we are. <laughs> it is. And life is a journey. A lot of chapters. We talk about that a lot. And, and we'll ask you again at about 10 till the hour to kind of give us some takeaways you'd like us to have. And so, Leslie, I want to ask you, too, not right now, but later on. Usually Teddy and I will offer up a quick anecdotal story, maybe something from our deep, dark past that uh, 
when we were that age starting out, uh, or maybe something we learned today from our guests. So uh, who knows what that'll be, but it'll be. <laughs> we a couple questions. Do you want to take those now or wait till then? Um, sure. We've done the introductions. I think we have a, a brief kind of difference between the apprenticeship and internship and in the respective two organizations. It's kind of cool that organizations can work in unison. They can work together and not siloed. So, mm -hmm. you know, kudos to, to the folks involved on both sides of that, because ultimately you're here to serve the, the, the students, the businesses, and they're your customers. And, in, and it's not necessarily who gets the credit, but ultimately who benefits. So I, I appreciate both of you coming on today. Yeah, uh, Leslie, what you got? All right, first question is from Dean. And he says he goes to Dienza College in Cupertino. I don't see any apprenticeship program in my college. How do I find out about possibilities? Any suggestions from you guys? Yes, yeah, so I had to Google that real quick to see where you are, Dean. Uh, California? Yeah. You are in California, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, every state has a state apprenticeship organization. So in North Carolina, it's called Apprenticeship NC. And it just so happens that here, um, that is housed within the system office of the community colleges. But a lot of times it might be housed in the State Department of Labor or Department of Commerce. And so um, two resources that I would recommend one would be the national, um, it's called apprenticeship.gov. So the national website, apprenticeship.gov. You can search by your location for local apprenticeships. And then the second resource I would say would be to do a quick Google search to see what organization in California oversees apprenticeships. And I can try to do that while we're talking. Um, and then you can, you'll, you'll probably have a local consultant you can reach out to and they'll let you know um, who locally is doing apprenticeships. Mm, good deal. Uh, there was another question too, wasn't there, uh, Leslie? Yes. Is there another one? Yes, yeah. this is from Donald. And he says, there used to be a program for state paid internships that companies could take advantage of. Does that still exist? So I think what you might be talking about is through the Workforce Development Board. Um, if that's what you're talking about, I actually just met with them recently and that does still exist where companies who um, hire someone for a paid work experience through the Workforce Development Board can have a certain percentage of the wages reimbursed for that person. And so partnered with apprenticeships, we're actually looking to do that with one of our employer partners. They're going to hire their apprentices and then um, apply for that wage reimbursement. So. Donald, if that's what you're speaking about, you can um, definitely check out the Workforce Development Board for that. Sure, and as, again, we've get, we're getting some good questions and hopefully get some comments in here from the folks that are attending. And we're up to 22,000 people today. I hope there's enough room for everybody to sit down, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can to make it, make it work for everybody. We appreciate you joining us. We have Danielle Rose with Forsyth Tech and Terry Cummings with Greater Winston-Salem, Inc. And riding sidekick today, Leslie Spees of The Resource. And Leslie, I don't even know, did I even ask you your role at The Resource? And if I, I think, did I? I, I shared at the beginning. Okay. But okay. I will share that I have been in HR for 30,000 years. <laughs> it's one, two, three. Would explain why I'm kind of crazy. <laughs> I bet you've seen a lot of changes too over the years. And I think we all have in our various industries, but uh, definitely something to, to look back on. And, and you kind of wonder where did the years go? I was talking to my colleague today, who's about set to, uh, well, to retire and, and just looking back on the years and all of the things that happened and they just go by in a flash sometimes. So uh, we have another question. Uh, Dean uh, has another one. Do um, you want to take that one, Leslie? Sure. He, he says, yeah. I know Facebook has apprenticeship program. Do I apply directly to Facebook or do it through my school? Good question. So there are two different um, apprenticeship models out there. Some of them are where the employer is the um, what's called the sponsor, meaning they have put together the program and then that employer just selects a college for the students to go to. What we do at Forsyth Tech is we are the sponsor. So we've done all the documentation, we've got everything set up and we find an employer partner. 
So Dean, my guess is with Facebook is that they are probably the sponsor of their own apprenticeship program. And so in that case, you would apply directly through them. Um, and a lot of times you'll see openings like that on indeed.com and, and different places that will say registered apprenticeship. And, and I will just kind of give that plug also. Whenever you see a post, um, a job posting that says apprenticeship, always verify that it is a registered apprenticeship program. That means it's registered through the Department of Labor. You are going to get that certification at the end because similar to what we talked about at the beginning, sometimes people will call an internship an apprenticeship, but it's not actually registered and, and there's no credentials at the end. So um, that would be my little uh, piece of advice as you're looking into that, Dean. There's a lot that goes into, I guess, from a legal and, and following, I mean, workers comp and all, I mean, if I'm internship, it, 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 am I being paid under the table versus, I mean, just there are a whole lot of things to come into play here and I'm no attorney. So the, you mentioned the website and I would ask both of you, Danielle and Terry, if you don't mind when, when you're not, when you aren't talking to uh, put your contact information in the chat, make sure it's available, not just to panelists, but panelists and attendees. And also, if you have relevant websites, I think you mentioned apprenticeship.org or .com or .gov. Oh, yeah, put it in the chat. <laughs> yep, you can go uh, and, and put it in there. And so folks that are watching here again, we're either at the age where we have children where this could benefit them, but also, as Danielle mentioned, and we, they have uh, apprenticeships and they've had folks from age 17 to 57. So it's never too old to start. If, if you're at a point and a fork in the road, you think, hey, I may want to go off in a different direction, but you want to look before you leap and try like it that. out. Yep. And have them try you out as well to see if it's a good fit both both ways. Uh, talk to Terry, talk to uh, Danielle, and they'll get you squared away with the information you need to make hopefully better better decisions. We're seeing uh, any more no, I think we're good on the, on the chat box. So let me throw this to both of you. And I think, uh, certainly, I think, Danielle, you've already addressed this. And, and Terry, if you'd like to chime in, maybe there's more to add. And that's the, uh, the, the point you, you'd made earlier. Work-based learning, it has different meanings and applications within different organizations. What does it mean to your organization? And I think, Danielle, you, you knocked that one out uh, early on. But anything, Terry, maybe you'd like to add? Just, just a community connection, and I think that's our role here at Greater Winston-Salem, Inc., is to connect students, connect community members with their next opportunity, uh, whether it be in the workforce, a training opportunity, and so on. So, you know, really um, what I'm seeing through the, most of my work is that we are facilitating the transfer of knowledge from the educational setting to the workforce setting. Interesting. And one of the, the comments, and I guess it's a generalization, but it it's fine. I guess we can use it to paint with a pretty broad brush. Apprenticeships, typically more blue collar. When I think apprenticeships, I think of being a, a carpenter or I think of, of masonry work and, and, and things along those lines, building stuff and repairing stuff. Yeah. Hmm? I said, not anymore. I was just not anymore. <laughs> I, I that, think that is one of the misconceptions about apprenticeships, you know, historically, absolutely, you know, 50 years ago, it was construction, manufacturing, mm -hmm. yeah. what we would call blue collar, um, but apprenticeships have, have been um, a push with the current administration, the past administration nationally, mm -hmm. they've been rebranded to be really across all industries. If you look at apprenticeship.gov, I want to say there's over 4,000 occupations that can be apprenticeable, and you have really high-level tech jobs like um, computer programmers, um, things like the logistics coordinators, you know, how does your raw good get from A to B to C to D yeah. to U at the store? I mean, really high tech stuff can now be apprenticed. And so I, I, I'm grateful for the work that the national organizations have done to, to make Interesting. That. Yeah. And so it, again, you know, I'm an old guy, so I have old school <laughs> thoughts here and that's, that's what I grew up with. And I've known, I actually, I've known kids that I went to school with yeah. high school that over the years, that's they, that they chose that path, but you're saying now that the game is a whole lot different. And so for the people watching now, or maybe watching it later on social media, um, investigate it. If you're not happy where you are, this is something you need to check with both these folks to, to figure out, is this for me? And so, so there's that. Um, any other, I think Don had a question about- He did. Off, um, yeah. 
He says, what kind of help uh, do you offer to companies that would like to set up an internship program but don't really know where to start? Terry, you wanna start with that? Yeah, I can, I can go with that. So, you know, obviously we have a program here. Um, you know, there are different organizations that have a program that can kind of help facilitate that, so to speak. A lot of uh, organizations also have their own internal programs. And that's where, you know, if you go to a job board or whatnot and search for internship uh, opportunities, you're going to see them come up through different organizations, especially your larger organizations. Um, so, you know, knowing where to start, it really, you know, depends on what you're looking for and what your needs are um, to hone in on. Are you looking for high school students? Do you want to take on that piece? Do you want to look at uh, college students? Because um, that that's they're two totally different areas and, and things you have to think about. So really um, looking at that, that first figuring out what positions you have, um, you know, from that standpoint uh, and, and what the skills are, are required to, to actually, actually go in and successfully be able to complete those tasks. So I think that on the internal side, there's a lot to figure out of where could you really utilize an intern and, uh, you know, what skills and, and experience really do you want them to have? Obviously, a college student's going to have a little bit more educational background and probably possibly some work experience to go along while, you know, working with high school students, they're, they're going to be very green, so to speak, and maybe not have any experience in the workforce. So you're having to, um, to offer different support levels. And there may be, is, am I hearing right from earlier, there may be governmental dollars available to help in certain cases, maybe with more so apprenticeships? Is that or... Um, yeah, so or, the, the first thing we ask for is usually a job description. So we would say, you know, hey, yeah. Don, based on the need, if you'll send us a job description, then from there, we will usually put together a proposal. Like at Forsyth Tech, we have this program, um, you know, this academic program that matches what you're looking for. And this is how we could target those students and connect them with you. And then absolutely, if, um, if apprenticeships are the best option, then there are dollars attached for the student to be able to actually go to school free um, there. Well, I shouldn't say free. The tuition is waived. Um, so the state of North Carolina is, is pushing apprenticeships so hard and believe in them so much as a workforce development tool that if you are an apprentice coming out of high school, the community college system waives your tuition. The state foregoes that revenue because apprenticeships are working. Um, and then yes, on the internship side, that's where we could absolutely look at your needs and see if they would help qualify for the, the benefits through the, the workforce board and connect you with those folks. Well, I've got a, a just a, I guess a question that comes up and that is access to technology and, and you've got different socioeconomic uh, layers within all communities to include Winston, which has a great disparity, uh, I think, between the lower socioeconomic and, and the upper and that, and that upward mobility, the ability to move. I see Terry, you're nodding your head. You know where I'm going with this. How, how, how are we, meaning Winston, how are we reaching out to maybe what I would call underserved or perhaps under the radar uh, folks to, to say, hey, this is a program you can take advantage of and make, make access to it something that is um, easy enough to figure out and, and you know, worthwhile for them to investigate. You set me up perfectly for that um, to discuss. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, to discuss um, Aspire Winston-Salem, which is our high school internship program. And uh, just a little bit of background on that. Uh, through the generosity of Truist Bank, um, they have given $1.2 million over a six-year period um, for us to manage this program. And there's a couple of, of perks to it. One is to the employer because the money, the bulk of the money is going to a compensation match. So the... Um, the employer, um, the minimum wage for the program is $10 an hour. The employer will get reimbursed $5 um, an hour per hour the student works. So there's a little bit of a perk there to get the community involved, to get some host companies involved, because ultimately the purpose of this program is to help interrupt the cycle of intergenerational poverty in our community. So in saying that, our target students are, serve, are, are students who may not be served in the school system as far as um, um, being on a career path. They may not have uh, be in the CPE program uh, that helps guide them through that. Um, so, you know, we're going to, you know, pick up 
and try to connect those students, not only with employment, so they can actually get some hands-on and real-world experience, but also some preparation. And I think going to the, the upward economic mobility piece, you know, designing a successful work-based learning program, equity is really at the foundation of it to make sure there is equal access and opportunity there. So preparing all uh, participants to be successful is really, is really key and I can speak for our program, you know, that's really our, our focus is to make sure we are um, serving students who need it, who may not have other services and may need that outside support. Um, uh, you just spoke about technology and those types of things. You know, we, we do find that, um, you know, not all students has equal access to technology, internet connection, phones, you know, laptops, that kind of thing. Um, transportation is also another barrier, and I'm sure Danielle can kind of, you know, speak to that as well. So, you know, we are um, using these dollars and, you know, structuring our program to be able to also focus on those areas that uh, where we can lift up students and uh, provide that equal access. Lunch with Randy and Teddy rolls on. Today is July 14th. My son's turned 34 today. Can you believe that? I, I mean, I, they were born when I was like five or I, I don't know, but uh, anyway, <laughs> just kidding. But uh, yeah, it's a great day. We have a couple of great guests and a great co-host. So Danielle Rose with Forsyth Tech. Nod your head, Danielle, so we know who you are. There you are. And Terry Cummings with Greater Winston-Salem, Inc. And co-host today, filling in for the vacationing Teddy Burris is Leslie Spees with The Resource. So Miss America wave. <laughs> you like that? Yeah. The, the, well, here, let's do that. Yeah. Very good. Hi, everybody. <laughs> If you have questions or comments for our guests, please put them in the chat box. We're happy to try to address them. We've had actually, what, a handful or more of, of questions that have come in. So we're happy to, to try to field those uh, questions. And yeah, this whole socioeconomic thing is, uh, it's an interesting and it's a very complex issue. And I don't know that any one program can solve it, but it looks like you're chipping away at that big boulder and, you know, it got to start somewhere. And so uh, I wonder, just on a, maybe flip this over to Danielle, um, the challenges faced by that same pop underserved population. How is Forsyth Tech addressing that in trying to get folks involved in these programs? Absolutely. So one of the biggest, um, I guess I'll call it a blessing that came out of COVID was the uh, CARES Act funds that um, educational entities got. And so Forsyth Tech received a large amount of care funds um, from the CARES Act that must go to our students and their needs. And so out of that came a brand new program called Forsyth Tech Cares. We were able to hire three care coordinators. And this is for any student on campus. We have a form they can fill out online and they get one-on-one -on -one direct contact with that care coordinator. And the things that the college can provide are um, and it's not just limited to this, pretty much anything you come with, there's probably a solution, but they have helped with uh, transportation costs, whether that's bus passes, or passes, they've helped with rental assistance. I know a couple of students that were able to get the um, security deposit and first month's rent paid to be able to continue their program. Uh, we opened a food pantry and we now have two fully stocked food pantries on two of our campuses. Students can get um, food items, pet food items, personal care items, school supplies. We put in the um, little pantries on each campus where folks can leave what they are not using and other folks can pick up what they need. Uh, we will help you get your driver's license reinstated if for some reason that's keeping you from work or school. Um, the list goes on. I mean, there's about 15 options on this form. And uh, we also have counselors on campus. If you are stressed or need someone to talk to, you can talk to um, free, free of cost. Oh, and technology. We have loaner uh, Chromebooks and wireless. Um, oh, I'm not technical technology person, I don't know what they're called, but the little internet uh, hubs. <laughs> and so personally with apprentices, I would say over half of them have taken advantage of this. And um, most of them would not have been able to continue working and going to school if it wasn't for this. So if there's anything keeping you from going back to college, Forsyth Tech can help you with it. I, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, we get asked this at our professional center, said, what's your placement rate? All right. So I don't know if you want to tackle that one, but 
Well, you know, so you let's say there are 100 people enrolled in a, in a program, an apprenticeship or an internship program. Of those, how many end up going to work ultimately with the company that they interned or apprenticed with? Ballpark, just a rough idea. Well, on the apprentice standpoint, um, you are actually hired by the company from day okay. one as an apprentice. So the goal is they've invested in you. You're going to continue to work there. Apprenticeship North Carolina did a ROI study. And for every dollar an employer spends on an apprentice, their return on investment is about $1.70. And so that just goes to show the um, you know, the, the, the worth that they are feeling, their company's invested in them, they're, they're going to stay. On, so on the apprenticeship standpoint or apprenticeship side, we've only had two completers because it's a two to three year program that started in 2019. Mm -hmm. So um, those two completers are, are doing well. On our work-based learning side, when I was in that office, it was running about 60% of interns were offered either a full-time or part-time job at their site or through a connection they made during their internship. And keep in mind, the 40% that did not, those might have been students that were not ready to go to work yet. They decided I'm going to do an internship and then maybe continue school or go into something different. So I thought 60% was was pretty good. Terry, what, what, numbers, what numbers do you have to show at this point so far? We are piloting our program this summer, so I don't have a lot of <laughs> numbers to, to offer you. I will say just from feedback I've gotten, um, you know, and again, we're dealing with high school students with this program. Uh, I've heard of two uh, that actually may get a part-time job offer after the internship program. So uh, from our small pilot pool, I will, I will say that's pretty good. Um, and, you know, like you've mentioned, the student being able to learn what they like and don't like is a big part of this too. Um, so from you know placement standpoint, I think there's just a lot of exploration there for the students to be able to say, hey, I would love to you know continue to work here or you know what, maybe not so much, but it still gives them a little bit of perspective um, on you know where they do want to end up end up or if they want to take another uh, internship somewhere else. Hey, Leslie, we have some uh, comments and questions. So if you're ready to tackle those, but before you do, I'm going to ask you, Leslie, I've, you weren't prepared for this one, Leslie. It's all right. Leslie works for the resource and they're a staffing firm. So they staff, you know, if, if a company is willing to, 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 to pay the, the fee, um, you know, they're the resource, their role is to identify talent to fill that. Have, have you been asked ever to identify people to fill internships or apprenticeships, to your knowledge. Is that something a staffing company might potentially be a resource for, pun intended? I think that we've collaborated in a few mm -hmm. cases. Yeah. Since I'm not directly on the staffing or recruiting side, um, I don't know all of the history, but I believe that for engineering positions that we were exploring some possibilities there of okay. assisting with that. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And if you, if you don't mind, tackle a couple absolutely. of these. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, so Dean had a couple of follow-up questions and his uh, question I think boils down to is the journeyman certification equivalent to an associate's or a bachelor's degree? Great question. So journey worker, um, I think you had also said this, Dean, you know, is that a plumber or is that an electrician? Traditionally, yes, that's what a journey worker was, but now anyone who completes an apprenticeship program gets a card, and it's something you keep in your wallet from the Department of Labor that says, I am a journey worker X, you know, it might be, I'm a journey worker cybersecurity analyst, and basically what that means is you completed an apprenticeship program, so on your question about is that the same as a, an associate or a bachelor's, an apprenticeship must have some sort of education and some sort of work, but there's no limit on what that education is. It, that's up to each um, apprenticeship program. So in our case, it is an associate degree because we're a community college and that's what we offer. Um, you referred to Facebook's apprenticeship program before. Theirs might be a bachelor's. It might be internal education that Facebook creates. So there's there's a lot of flexibility, which can cause confusion, but at the same time, it really, um, a, apprenticeship can be a solution for anyone because of that. And so, no, you do not need an internship before you get an apprenticeship. Um, certain companies might require you have, you know, certain credentials or certain um, GPA or certain something, but I've never seen one say, oh, you must have been an intern before. 
Any other uh, comments and questions we have in the chat box? Can I chime in there? real quick, Randy? Yeah, um, absolutely. On the, yeah, on the question you asked, Leslie, you know, back uh, when I was working in, in private industry and we did use apprentices, um, staffing organizations were actually really helpful on the pre-apprenticeship side. And I know Danielle and I have had several conversations lately about pre-apprenticeships and apprenticeships and how all that ties together. But that pre-apprenticeship piece is usually what? a couple of weeks to about two or three months, just depending. And a lot of organizations, you know, it, it's really that, you know, trial phase to see if it works out. So a lot of organizations will, you know, utilize um, staffing companies to, to assist them with that. So I think that's a really good strategy um, for, for the organization. Um, and I noticed one of the questions from Dean is, do I need an internship before I get an apprenticeship? And I think that question, and I'll toss it to Danielle on that pre-apprenticeship side, uh, may answer his question. That's a good point. We forgot that, or I forgot that in my definitions. And so uh, when you have a registered apprenticeship program, you can also have a registered pre-apprenticeship. And it's just what it sounds like. It happens before the apprenticeship to prepare you. And so here at First Sight Tech, our pre-apprenticeship is a three-week class over the summer. Ours just finished on Monday where students got the very basic introduction to manufacturing and they got help with their resumes and we introduced them to employer partners. And then now we're in that in-between time where they're actually offered and accept an apprenticeship position and transition from a pre-apprentice to an apprentice. And so absolutely good point, Terry. Um, you might wanna check on uh, Facebook's program, Dean, and see if they have any kind of pre-apprenticeship that you could go ahead and get started on. And again, don't hesitate, Danielle and Terry, to put your contact info. You may have done it up thread there in the chat, but uh, do. again, don't hesitate if, if, if you have the opportunity to put any information in there that might be relevant. I got to ask you, you know, COVID has impacted the whole world here in the last year and a half, and I'm sure internships, no different. I imagine they were like the rest of the world kind of shut down, right? Or virtual or how, how did, uh, what happened last year? And, and what's different now? Do you want me to take that one, Terry? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with our apprentices, you know, in, in manufacturing, especially, there's just certain things you cannot do virtually. I mean, you can do all the simulations of the world of how to use a lathe and how to use a mill, and it's going to be completely different than actually doing it. And so a lot of our lecture classes went online, and then a lot of our lab classes, you would have sign up time and it would be more small group labs. Um, but none of our apprentices stopped working. All of the companies continued through COVID and our apprentices followed the COVID rules of their, of their company. So some good things that have come out of that, um, several of our employer partners actually set up workstations for the apprentices at their manufacturing plant because they're not having to drive to school after they've been at work. So instead they can actually sit right there on site, log into their class, you know, maybe it's a one hour lecture, they get that over, um, you know, they get that part done, they still have two hours in their day, they can stay and work on the job two more hours. And so that has been a really neat um, thing that's kind of stuck from, from the virtual world. Hmm. Terry, how about you with uh, regard to Greater Winston and how has COVID impacted in the last two years, how you go about your process with helping people? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone just had to like scramble to figure out, you know, what do we mm -hmm. do? And I can yeah. speak for us, you know, here at Greater Winston-Salem, we continued with our internship programs um, internally because we usually uh, have one or two interns on staff most of the year. And um, I can say that we trans um, transitioned them virtual. And one of our high school students, she did an excellent job, but she kept saying, I really wish I could come in the office. I really wish I could come in the office. Obviously, we couldn't allow it uh, at that time, but we were able to turn her apprenticeship or internship into more of a hybrid model, uh, you know, where we could stagger who was in the office and we could, you know, it's all about scheduling and, and making sure that employees are safe. So, um, you know, we, we did that hybrid model and it worked out pretty well pretty well. Um, you know, I, you know, with her, she, our, she's a rock star. She did great with it. You know, I think it really just depends on the person. Some people really need to be in person and they need to, you know, learn those interpersonal skills and be able to practice them a little bit differently than you can virtually. I think back, uh, 
years ago i mentioned my sons having a my twin sons having birthday today i think my one son matt was an intern there back uh, when gail was there okay. uh, and oh gosh this would have been a number of years ago but anyway <clears throat> i digress but great experience and it's something i think i'll probably talk about here at the end of the, the show today about looking before you leap and the ability now uh, so readily available that, uh, you, you know, it's ne nothing's perfect and I get it. And, but uh, here again, information is uh, useful as you go about trying to plot your course here. Any other, uh, any other comments or questions that you wanted to throw in based on the chat? Uh, and if not, we've got a couple more and then we'll move into um, kind of a summary segment, but anything you see on there that you wanted to, to throw in at all, Leslie, anything? Um, I think yeah. we have, Pretty well up to date. Yeah. All right. Sounds think, good. Yeah. Uh, I can quickly address. It looks like Dean just had one other question about the journey worker. Um, so, okay. so, Dean, a, a journey worker means that you specifically uh, completed a registered apprenticeship program. So you will not want to put on a resume or an application that you're a journey worker unless you completed a registered apprenticeship program. Um, so I just want to throw that out there that those words are definitely connected. Got a hypothetical for you here. Oh gosh! Put, her, put it on the. I put on the resume that I have an apprentice, an apprenticeship, or an internship. How much of a leg up is that? Just again, hypothetical. If you, if you're an employer, um, and I imagine it varies. So I get it if you want to punt this thing away. But it, it, what? How big of an advantage is that for somebody, especially maybe who is coming out of high school recently or maybe recently getting ready to or has graduated from college? How important, how impactful is that? I think it's, it's you know, has a huge impact um, mm -hmm. and, and really gives the competitive advantage to that student um, or recently graduated student uh, to go into the workforce because it does show initiative. It shows they have, you know, been in a, in a learning situation that they can apply uh, at your organization. And, you know, it, um, you know, it's really a win-win because if, if I was looking at a, a resume and I saw um, that that student had recently graduated and, you know, already been in the workforce and went through some preparation to get there, um, I would definitely say that, you um, totally um, gives the competitive advantage to that student. Yeah, and Leslie, is, is I know you're not in the recruiting side of, of the resource. Um, so if, if you wanna speak for your cohorts, but I mean, what, what kind of weight do they generally assess? Again, these guys are starting out at, at the starting line and now somebody has an internship or an apprenticeship versus somebody who doesn't. How big of a difference maker is that? I think it definitely helps. I mean, anything that you do to improve your skills and qualifications, I think is helpful. Okay. Uh, we've got, well, gosh, we've got about 15 minutes left. So about five minutes from now, we'll ask each of you to briefly uh, kind of give us a, a few takeaways you'd like folks to have about your program, about uh, the, the general topic of internship, apprenticeship. Leslie, I'll ask you to share a some kind of story you can make it up if you want to okay. we would never know the difference so <laughs> feel free to do that and i'll uh, i'll throw in my two cents and i'll also mention about our guest next week and leslie it's somebody who actually presented at one of our sherm meetings back in i think it was february or march so mm -hmm. uh, a familiar name and a familiar face i'm sure but we'll uh, we'll get to that here in a little bit um how if somebody wants to get involved and i see you put your your email addresses in there. It's one thing to sit here and go, you know, this is fun. Okay, I get it. I might want to try this. But I'll tell you what, for a lot of folks, they get paralyzed um, because they don't know which way to go. And they're afraid if they do the wrong thing, somebody's going to slap them on the wrist. And adults are the same way. And we talk about, oh, I'll do this one day. Uh, maybe I'll do this. And maybe even companies are like, well, you know, we could use an intern here. But <sighs> It's governmental regulation, and we don't want to have to mess with all that stuff. And I don't hold my hand on this thing. Get help, help reassure me that this isn't going to cost me an arm and a leg, and I can do it without having to, uh, you know, hire a team of attorneys and consultants. How tough is this? How, make this easy for me, Danielle. Take take it away. Make make on me the, feel good about this. On the student standpoint, I have had employers tell me. I would say ten out of ten employers say. If you show up 
on time and you ask questions, you will be a great apprentice or intern. We don't expect you to come in the door knowing these skills already. We expect you to make mistakes. That's what an intern and an apprenticeship is for. It's to learn. And so if you come in and you can already do it all, then you probably shouldn't be an intern. You should go ahead and apply for a job. Um, on the employer side, so we being the sponsor, for SciTech being the sponsor of LEAP, takes all of that government paperwork off of you from the start. And so we have a, an eight-page document called our standards. It is a legal document that has been um, registered with the Department of Labor. It's been approved. And so I simply send you the eight-page document. I let you look over it. Um, some companies will have their legal team look over it. And then there is a two page agreement that the employer signs that basically says, we're gonna offer a good experience. We're gonna pay them. We're gonna allow them mm -hmm. to go to school. Um, you know, I walk through all that with you and then you turn it into me and I communicate directly with Apprenticeship North Carolina. So there is no documentation or paperwork on your part except for at the very beginning to get things started. Um, so. And even yep. then, we've already done it. You're just reviewing and signing. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Terry, yeah. make it easy for me. What What do I need to know? Um, really on the front end, you know, Greater Winston-Salem is working mm -hmm. to identify students, working with the principals and the counselors and all that to do that identification of students who qualify and are eligible for the program. Uh, we also have uh, employability workshops with our, with our friends at Forsyth Tech. We partner with them to help um, prepare students to go into the workplace. Uh, just with, you know, your, some of the, you know, workplace etiquette, soft skills, those types of things. And, um, you know, we obviously want to involve the employer, but not in a painful type of way, but to give the employer knowledge and, and empower them to be able to make uh, the decisions on, you know, which, um, you know, what they need the uh, intern for, what types of jobs and uh, duties they have for that intern and who would be the best fit for those jobs and duties. So we, you know, I, I call it a collaboration. And I mean, it's definitely an investment on the employer side, yeah. but, you know, looking at the outcomes and, and really what you could do for your organization as far as building talent pipelines and identifying and connecting with students who may be your employees one day, I think is really valuable. Hey, what have we left out? Anything that we should have touched on that we didn't? We've got just a moment or two. Is there anything you can think of? You know, Danielle, you're nodding your head. It's something you'd like to throw in there we haven't really yeah. covered yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, so one thing when I think yeah. about apprenticeships and internships at the college level is it's kind of a, a triad. There's three partners here. So we've talked a lot about the student. We've talked a lot about the employer, but the college also gains benefits from these experiences because it keeps us relevant in our programs. If we have a student that's, you know, one's working out at Siemens Energy and one's working at the Herbalife facility and one's working at Progress Rail, we're out there, we're visiting them, we're, we're learning about what they're doing and we can implement new technologies being used in the workforce at the college. Um, I've even had examples before in, in IT where we were teaching the most up-to-date programming languages and there was an employer that was actually using an older program language and he said, you stopped teaching this, but we still use it. Can you at least touch on it? And so we added it back into our curriculum. So I think, you know, employers, students, they put so much pressure on, you know, well, what am I going to get out of this? Am I going to, am I going to do it right? We are your partner because we are also learning from you. So we're all learning from each other. There's no right or wrong. Um, you know, we, like, like Terry said, it, it's a collaborative experience. So I just wanted to throw that out there that, that we're learning as we go also. Sounds good. And, you know, it's not my area within Goodwill, but we have uh, skills training classes and not necessarily, I don't think they're internships. Uh, I don't, I don't necessarily think they're apprenticeships, but we also try to help with the skills training to prepare people for, um, you know, for future careers, for sure. All right, we're, let's move into the, the final segment here. And that's a, kind of a, a, what are the takeaways we need to have here? And I don't know who drew the short straw and needs to go first, but dive in. What are a couple, three, and then we'll turn it over to the other cohort there. And, and uh, what are some things we need to, to remember from today? I'll dive in. I, I think right. what we need to um, remember are work-based learning opportunities are, are strategic and they're strategies to you know help students, to help um, the employer. And really, and much beyond that, because you know the stakeholders in these programs are 
um, you know, the student, the employer, the community itself, the families of the students that we are serving, uh, the educational institutions, there are just so many stakeholders. And I think we need to remember that and that the good that can be done uh, within these programs and that is, it is a collaborative effort. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Anything else at all to add? Um, I would I would add that it's it's never too late. So as a student, you can be or, or just as a member of our community, you can become a student, you can become an intern, you can become an apprentice at any point in your life. Um, that is the beauty, again, of a community college, especially. So if you're in high school, if you have kids, grandkids in high school, Terry is going to be a wonderful contact. If you uh, have already graduated high school, whether you've been out two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, community colleges are designed for adults. We, we operate on adult learners. And so we are here at any point. Um, on that same point for employers, it's never too late to become involved in one of these. I think a couple of employers have said to me, well, gosh, everyone else in my industry already did it. So they've taken all the students. Well, that's not true. Even though my favorite phone call is when a company calls and says, hey, I'd like to hire one of your maintenance techs. And I can say, oh, they've already been employed for two years as an apprentice. Do you want to join on and do that? And then the next year, they're hiring apprentices. So um, it, it's never it's never too late. Yeah, there's a question for Danielle about whether Guilford Technical Community College yes. has similar programs and offerings. I will quickly touch on this, but Terry used to be involved in that program, so she can talk okay. more. Um, the, the big difference is uh, Shanley and the GTCC program is their registered apprenticeship program is um, employer sponsored. So the employers are doing the paperwork. Um, it is a youth program. They are starting then their junior year of high school, whereas we're an adult program. And it is a four year program, whereas we are a two to three year program. And Terry can probably answer any other specific questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you touched on the basic differences. And I think yeah, that the, um, the high school piece is definitely, it brings a different uh, part piece to the equation there. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a huge sponsorship with or um, collaboration with uh, GTCC and the you know, employer partners. Um, it's a great program. They've had a lot of success with it. Um, I know one of the, the companies that, that works with the program, they really use a lot, utilize it as a staffing model and was really able to get a lot of employees off of, of their apprenticeship program. So um, I, I see benefits to both um, to, to both programs, but yeah, the, the GTCC program would be through GAP. Hey, I got to ask you this, All right? So I, I lived in Ohio for many years and grew up in Rhode Island. So let's say I'm sitting here in Winston-Salem and I said, you know what? I got an uncle who knows somebody back in Rhode Island, uh, whatever, right? So can, can I do my apprenticeship or my internship out of state? And would I leverage your programs or would I need to deal with a similar program in, in Rhode Island, let's say? Is that something? Do you get those requests to say, hey, I've got a cousin and my grandparents live in Indiana. Can I can I go there in the summertime and have an internship? And can I get any funding for that? I don't know. Just a so question. For the, for the registered apprenticeship program, you have to select what state you're going to register it in. And okay. so the easiest way is to work and live in the same state. We did have a company here in Winston-Salem that sent all their students virtually through Forsyth Tech, but had them working all up and down the Eastern Coast. And I'll tell you, it did not work out great. Um, part of that's probably because of COVID and the travel restrictions and all of that. So we're looking at how we can get it started again, so. Okay, well, good, I appreciate that. We're getting short on time. So my thanks again, you guys hang around for a couple of minutes. Daniel Rose, raise your hand. Daniel Rose with Forsyth Tech. Terry Cummings, there you are with Greater Winston-Salem Inc. Leslie, you got a real quick uh, anecdotal thing here, real quick. Anything? I was going to tell my life story, but you've only given me a few minutes. <laughs> well, geez, it's getting late. Sorry. I'll, I'll just give a real quick story on my um, 30,000 years in HR using Randy and Teddy math. Uh, so I really had, uh, like many, when I was in college, I really didn't have a good idea of what I was going to do. Um, and actually, at the time, wanted to be a clinical psychologist, which um, uh, the path to that at that time was you get your doctorate. And that was pretty competitive. So I was like, well, maybe I can use psychology in business somehow. And that's kind of how I got into HR. It was during the time it transitioned from personnel to HR. 
and uh, have stayed in that career path. If I had to do over again, uh, don't know if I'd do the same thing or not. I think I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> um, it kind of fits in with my skill set. But um, anyway, that's kind of the story of how I got into my particular career path. Yeah, thank you, Leslie. I appreciate it. And yeah, like I said, all I say too often, life is a journey, a lot of chapters in an old book, and I'm no exception. I started out like I said, I wanted to play for the Red Sox. So once that dream went away, then I was a radio guy and had a nice little voice. But uh, at some point, it was time to get a real job. And so one thing led to another and to another and to another and to another. And, and here I am and I love what I do. And it has value um, beyond just the, the, the money, but how we impact people's lives. And that's why I always ask the why question. So I really appreciate all three of you sharing that. I know we're getting short on time. So I'll, I'll use that as my story. Just uh, be open to opportunity. Because if, if I had to pull a room of 20 people, I know we don't do it in person, but if let's say we did, how many of you at age 50 are doing what you thought you would do at age 17? Yeah. Zero, probably. <laughs> uh, very few. But anyway, again, thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Leslie. Next week's guest, uh, Leslie, you might remember Jason Stitt. He's a, a mediation attorney from Canada. Uh, and he spoke about... Yeah, remember that? It's really cool. Very interesting. And, and, you know, how to deal with people, whether it's on the job, whether it's in your personal life, problem solving, how to diffuse situations, how to, how to talk through a scenario or situation to arrive at something that both people can live with and feel good about. And that's a, it's, it's a real talent. And it's not something that you can just kind of wing it. Uh, and so Jason will outline how we get all that stuff done next week. Be sure to join us. That'll be on July 21st at 12 noon and join us at 1155 for our behind the scenes. Teddy will be back. I'm sure he'll have all kinds of stories about his adventures and we'll look forward to hearing that again. Thank you, Leslie, for joining us today and also Danielle and, and Terry. And it, I see it's one o'clock. So Randy Wooden saying so long and we'll see you next week. Take care, guys. Bye. Thanks.